Thanks, Bill. Uh, really honored to uh, highlight and introduce two of our two great speakers from uh, original from UBC, right? And uh, Lindsay Higi, he was the first one of the first presenters at the original uh, the first cloud meetup just a year ago. Um, she has a great presentation on just the cool work she's doing with projects like Pangeo. Um, and you know, you're currently with uh, Project Jupiter, right? Uh, working with the, one of the co-founders of Project Jupiter, Fernando Perez. Uh, which she also helped introduce um, Jim Coleander, currently uh, also at UBC, as also at the Pacific Institute of Mathematics and Sciences. Uh, he has a great vision for the future of kind of interactive computing that uh, he'll talk in depth about. But uh, really honored to have uh, our guest, Jana, but, but also people with deep Berkeley roots to really highlight these new amazing ideas. So uh, I'll take it away. Thanks, Anthony. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to introduce Jim. Uh, we've been working together on um, looking at different scenarios for bringing interactive computing to uh, classrooms and into different educational settings. So Jim is the director of uh, PIMS, which is the Pacific Institute of Mathematical Sciences. He's also a professor of mathematics at UBC and an entrepreneur. He's got an ed tech startup. Um, so an eclectic, eclectic set of skills. Um, and today he'll be sharing a bit about um, some of the projects in Canada. Uh, so there's a project called Syzygy, which is a deployment of uh, Jupyter Hubs that allow students um, and researchers across Canada to access interactive computing resources. So anyone at any of the major universities in Canada can log on online with their university credentials and have access uh, to computing resources. Another project is called Callisto, and Callisto is bringing um, interactive computing to students in grades 5 to 12. Um, so providing opportunities for students to get exposed to computing, interactive computing, and computational thinking um, before they even get to university. So with that, I will let Jim take it away. Thank you very much. I'm really honored to be able to speak here. So I was a postdoc at Berkeley from 1997 to 2001, and it's such an inspirational place. I'm really excited to be back and to have this chance to speak to you all. Uh, so, what I want to describe is um, a proto-venture, something that I'm exploring to try to find a way to scale and make sustainable what's turned out to be kind of uh, a demo that has run a month. Uh, the demo has been remarkably successful, perhaps catastrophically successful, and so I kind of want to describe the history of that um, demo and then uh, introduce some of the discussion related to what I think needs to happen next. And much like the previous speaker, I welcome interruptions, so please feel free to raise your hand if you wish. So uh, together with many others, I'm exploring the idea to create a consortium called 2i2c, which stands for the International Interactive Computing Collaboration. So if you want to write that down, these slides are hosted on the web. So if you go to bit.ly 2i2c-berkeley, you can get access to the slides. And there are many hyperlinks in these slides. So if you want to follow along and read other things, please feel free to do so. So as Lindsay mentioned, I serve as the director of PIMS, and I'm a professor at UBC. And I'm very grateful for the support from those two organizations. So here are just some links on prior blog posts, uh, a talk, and an invitation to UC Berkeley and maybe other universities to help build this organization. So I want to tell you a little bit about PIMS because I think it sets the context. So the Pacific Institute for the Mathematical Sciences is kind of a sister institute to MSRI, but it's different in that it is a distributed institute, and it serves 10 universities, the University of Washington, University of Victoria, University of British Columbia, Simon Fraser, the University of Alberta, the University of Calgary, the University of Lethbridge, the University of Saskatchewan, the University of Regina, and the University of Manitoba. Now I suspect that some of you have heard of all of those universities. All of you have probably heard of some of those universities, but I suspect that some of those universities you haven't heard of, potentially. And that's kind of the challenge of PIMS, is that we are serving an eclectic group of universities with different levels of research capacity, different budgets, different size departments, 
And when I came on in the opportunity to help lead this organization, I asked myself, how can we help these mathematical scientists, statisticians, computer scientists, peer and applied mathematicians every day? Can we do something that goes beyond when they get some money from the organization to run a week-long workshop or to help pay for a postdoc? Can we do something that affects them every day? And around that time, I was kind of falling in love with this platform called Jupiter. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if we could deliver Jupiter to all of these folks? And that was kind of the initial idea, which I'll, I'll build more towards. So uh, there are some inspirations behind that idea. And maybe the first inspiration is Jupiter itself, uh, which is, in some sense, Berkeley led. Uh, and it stands for Julia, Python, and R, but now serves many, many different languages and delivers this integrated developer environment through a web browser with the compute engine possibly hosted on the cloud or possibly hosted on your laptop. I find it inspiring. Back in 2015, when I was thinking of this idea, I saw this blog post from Jessica Hamrick, who was a postdoc here at Berkeley, and she described how to use the cloud to host Jupyter Hub in a classroom environment, and I thought it was fabulous. And with uh, uh, my colleague that I'll mention in a moment, we also took inspiration from seeing things that happened after Jessica's post, um, this remarkable program that's teaching people data science at Berkeley that I believe should be replicated globally. And I'm also very inspired by another cloud project that I understand Lindsay spoke about in this forum in the past, which is Pangeo. So it combines Jupyter as a front end, with Dask and a bunch of other resources, and it's transforming the way that big data climate science is working. So some of these things happened after the initial inspiration, but I want to kind of give you a sense of why I think there's a lot of momentum here. Um, and maybe one last thing that was really inspirational for me is I uh, was fortunate when I was previously at the University of Toronto to spin out an education technology company called Crowdmark. And while doing that, I learned about the cloud. And I learned the way the cloud can horizontally scale with very, very few engineers and do some remarkable things. And I thought maybe we can do something like that with education and research with Jupyter. So I have a few partners on this that I want to acknowledge quickly. The first and perhaps most beloved by me right at the moment is Dr. Ian Allison. Uh, he is the system administrator at PIMS. And he's incredibly talented and has helped me to bring this vision forward by being a cloud architect and showing how to deploy Jupyter, taking advantage of um, these remarkable tools. Uh, I've also worked with Compute Canada, which is a high-performance computing platform um, in Canada. And they were very great, gracious when I asked them to have access to the underlying infrastructure to make this service available nationwide, and they helped us. And I also worked with the network provider in the province of Alberta, which is called Cybera, on one of these projects that Lindsay referenced called Callisto. Um, so that's the idea. Maybe we can make Jupiter nationwide. And it's a good idea, but it's not fully thought out, which is partly the purpose of this talk. <laughs> so here's a history, and you can't see this, but I'm just going to guide. So I have this idea. We should have Jupiter Hub for everybody. I was inspired by Jess's post. I started talking to Compute Canada. This is back in like 2016. We made an agreement in June of 2017. Um, we launched in uh, uh, 2017. Um, in summer of 2018, at JupyterCon 2018, we had 8,000 users. Uh, in August of 2019, we had 16,000 users. We now have 25,000 users. We serve 23 universities with vanilla hubs, and we have 10 deeper hubs supporting different kinds of research communities. Um, we also responded to a call for proposals from the Government of Canada and launched this project called Callisto, which offers open education resources targeted at grades 5 to 12 posted on the cloud. And, and then we got 1.5 million twice, uh, and that project continues to advance. Uh, so here's a picture of the Syzygy hubs that are across Canada. So all of those universities are getting cloud-hosted Jupyter Hub access, similar to what Data8 provides here at Berkeley, from a little tiny institute in Vancouver. And it's essentially managed by one talented engineer. And that's pretty brittle. And there's some risks if you're trying to build a data science program like Data8 on top of this flimsy infrastructure, there might be some problems. Um, that's a picture of something earlier today. That's usage. So the different colors represent the different universities. 
Um, we're serving just over 25,000 users. At the time I took the picture, we had 136 live. You can see the pulse of the last seven days of usage, and there's other statistics there just to give you a sense of, of what it looks like. So Callisto is this project that I mentioned where we're developing OER resources leveraging Jupyter Kids. Um, we've also been really inspired by working with some research teams by offering kind of curated, interactive, high-performance computing in some sense. Uh, we aspire to provide kind of perfect barrier data integrations, and we've observed that once these kinds of resources are available on the web, accessible through the cloud, through thin clients or whatever, you have an explosively collaborative scenario where people within a university or people across multiple universities can interact with these tools, share the code, share access to API-backed data sources, and do remarkable things inspired by what's happened here at Berkeley. And ultimately, what I'm really excited about is this is accelerating the mobilization of knowledge and the discovery. So we're amplifying what we do within the university around the research service and education mission. Um, and there are some other links of different things that we've collaborated on. So with Cybera, we set up Data Science for Albertans, which is training people across Alberta. Uh, we were working with people that are working on immunosystem response on iReceptor with genomics data. I helped some folks in the Earth, Ocean, Atmospheric Sciences Department at UBC on phytoplankton. And there are many, many, many other examples. By far, from my point of view, the most exciting example of this is Pangeo, which is for big data climate science. But the model of Pangeo is something that is a pattern that's beginning to be replicated in neuroscience and eventually in many, many other disciplines. So the cloud is facilitating new kinds of computation and new kinds of communities to assemble around the tools and collaborate in new ways. So some lessons learned from all of this. The research and education ecosystem is going through a profound transformation. This transformation is akin to what happened with email, but I think it's more significant. It's changing the way we communicate. And the way we communicate is the way we intera interact in education and in research, and it is profound and there's huge demand. We've also validated that this demand can be met with an appropriate cloud strategy. What we have, uh, I think, failed so far to define a sustainable business model so that this type of service can be reliably delivered with the appropriate uptime guarantee and so forth that is necessary for these kinds of programs. Um, we have shown that programs like Data8 require appropriate infrastructure, and to replicate Data8 at other universities requires a lot of skills that not every university has. We've also seen that a handful or two very talented engineers can run hubs for 50 universities, say. So having every university develop this kind of engineering expertise is failing to take advantage of the economies of scale associated with the cloud. And instead, we should build some organization that is totally aligned with the university mission that can provide this type of service with the appropriate constraints to ensure that it's done well. So I propose that founding visionary universities like the University of California at Berkeley and the University of British Columbia, and maybe others, like the University of Washington or UCSD or maybe the University of Toronto, form a consortium that defines a very rigorous governance model and then finds a way to build the perfect vendor that sells this solution back to themselves with the appropriate constraints. And that's what I think needs to be built. And I welcome support from Skydeck or from Foundry or from Y Combinator, or from any of you in this room. So just a couple comments on the mission, because this is supposed to be a short talk. I envision that this um, entity will provide interactive computing as a service for higher education with a very transparent and explicit pricing mechanism. It should have a perfect service level agreement so that every chief information officer and CTO looks at it and says, that's right, that's the way we absolutely want these things to look. And I also envision that this organization should have a consulting uh, part, part of it, 2i2c labs, a way to embed these engineers in the library or embed these engineers inside of research teams so that we can learn from the research communities that are using these tools and with their input and expertise and collaboration, we improve the open source tools that are helping to drive these changes in research and education. And last, but perhaps most important, any extra revenue that this organization builds should not go back to founding investors as some sort of a unicorn strategy. Instead, this revenue stream should be aligned with the open source communities that inspired all of this, 
And that reinvestment back in the research communities and the open source communities that are building all of this is where that extra budget should go. In order to achieve this kind of differentiation among others that could also offer this, the real differentiation is that this organization has to be tightly aligned with the universities that provide its oversight. Thanks. <laughs> I welcome any questions. Yes. So you, you um, talked about Pangeo as, as an example of how a research community is using Jupiter. Could you, since we heard about that a while ago, could you talk about what are the other examples? I'm just trying to visualize what does, how does a researcher become part of a community that's using a Jupiter Hub to do their research and build sure. new possibilities? So, um, I am slightly intimidated to answer this question with experts like Lindsay in the room that use this on a daily basis, but let me try to answer it. So um, the MIPS-6 database, how big is it, like 24 petabytes or something? Six It'll petabytes? 60. Huh? It'll be 60. So, hey, here's 60 petabytes from NASA, um, and I'd like, it, I'd like to do some uh, you know, clustering on it and analyze this data. Well, that's pretty hard. You can't really you know, drive a semi-truck filled with hard drives down to my apartment and set that up. So this has been deployed, as I understand it, on the AWS Oregon Data Center. And then in this community of very talented climate scientists who also had really incredible developer operations skills set up HPC-like uh, elastic tools on that same data center. They're about to compute to the data. And then they opened this up through like a GitHub login. So if you have a GitHub account, you can log into this tooling and this tooling is right next to these 60 petabytes, and you can slice and dice and start to look at climate change questions related to all of this data. So a couple things that are really important about that that are independent of climate science, which is the more abstract thing that I'm kind of headed for. So the use of commercial cloud instead of traditional HPC works in this case because the data has a certain kind of structure and the types of work that you want to do is not the generic type of work that you do on a standard parallel machine. So it's kind of slotting into a specific kind of HPC role and you can do it in this environment this way. And then second, because it's on the cloud, you can offer access to this resource through a login. And this login can be mediated by some other vendor like Google or like GitHub. And now you have the opportunity to set up a community. So at a perhaps less ambitious scale, if we all had laptops here, we could open up our laptops and I could give you a single URL. And you click that URL and then it prompts you, say, to log in with GitHub or log in with, with Google. And then that automatically takes you into a cloud-hosted environment, hosted on Compute Canada, and you all see the code that I set up with that link. You all have access through the APIs to the data. And so we can now run a hackathon. So we did that on Monday and Tuesday at Simon Fraser University exploring the infectious disease modeling around COVID-19. So we set up a dedicated hub, we gathered the best data we could from the COVID-19 outbreak, and we assembled teams that competed against each other in a hackathon using kind of shared computing and this assembly of data to try to move forward on how are we gonna deal with the pandemic potential. So those are a couple examples um, that I, I think showcase what can be done with this type of infrastructure. Yeah. You, you mentioned the, the question of I would say governance. So to what, ex what extent is, do ongoing efforts uh, in online education, now that we're sort of through the MOOC hype, and into ongoing, ongoing organizations like Udacity, Coursera, but particularly edX, uh, who, who have had their, their, their uh, allegiance to their core mission tested pretty, pretty well with respect to online education. That's working its way through. They, they seem to, from the, the open courseware structure at MIT, very kind of closely held, but very aligned with the mission. edX, which is a consortium based, do they provide any sort of model for a more research oriented? Sure. So, so I was very impressed with the MOOC hype. I was excited about it. But the way things have unfolded, I don't think the emancipatory potential that was promised in 2012 has emerged. So there's a lot to learn from that. Um, there are a few things, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I think edX is the, the leader here in many ways, but their open source code, as far as I'm aware, is not open. Uh, the commercial edX code is not available. Uh, there are challenges around this whole process. So, uh, 
maybe that's not the best way to answer your question. But what I would say is there are many organizations like Archive, or JSTOR, or the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, or edX, uh, or Unizen, different kinds of consortia that involve bringing together universities to try to achieve a common goal. And I have ideas about how this organization should be built myself, but I don't think that one person, even if it's me bringing the vision, should define this organization. It has to be done in a consultative and collaborative way with the universities that launch it. Um, but right now, I, I am very concerned that if we don't do this, if we don't find a way for universities to provide this tooling, the universities are going to find it another way. And where might they find it? They might find it hosted on Amazon. Or they might find it hosted on Google. And in this way, we run the risk of recreating what we did with Internet 1.0 and Elsevier and Springer. And we might concede the management and ownership of the collaboration stack, and in the future, maybe also the, the stack that we use for publishing these new kind of interactive journal formats that might be different from PDF, but instead be built on these notebooks. So governance is really important. I don't have all worked out. I think the EDX model is one thing to look at, and we have to learn from it, but I don't have it all figured out. Any other comments or questions? All right, well, thank you all for the opportunity to speak here.